Welcome to our worship of God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ here at Harlandale Christian Church today. We're glad that we have this privilege, this opportunity to fellowship with each other and to come together to fellowship with our God. Our prayer is what that opening song has said, O oh God, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. May your Spirit speak to our hearts, to our needs, to our lives, so that we can draw nearer to you. David says in Psalm 19, verse 14, something that ties in this request, this plea, that God's Spirit fall fresh on me. May the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings, for your presence here among us. Thank you for your love. And thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your son Jesus, our Savior, who paid the price for the redemption of our sins, for forgiveness of our sins on that cross of Calvary. Father, today as we join together to worship you, may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Speak to us, Father. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your love. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean singing
Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy snow, Messiah still.
as we come to the time in our worship service where we worship our God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by partaking of the Lord's Supper, the communion, partaking of the unleavened bread and the cup that remind us of the sacrifice of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Taking the place of the sacrificial lamb at Passover and becoming the sacrificial lamb once and for all so that all who accept him as Lord and accept him as Savior receive forgiveness, receive redemption, know the, the joy, the promise of our sins being forgiven and we receive the promise, our hope of eternal life in heaven with him, with our Father God. Only the perfect Son of God, Jesus, the sinless Son of God, the sinless Lamb, the spotless Lamb, can take away the sins of all the world, of all of mankind. So as we partake of this bread today, remembering the body of Jesus, our Savior, as he was nailed to the cross, as his side was pierced, as his head was pierced with thorns, and as we take of the cup that reminds us of his blood that he shed willingly so that we might be forgiven, washed white as snow, Let's do as our song of communion today. Let's remember that only Jesus is worthy, is qualified, is capable of bringing us salvation and the hope of eternal life. Worthy is the Lamb of God to take away our sins, to give us hope. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your gift of your only begotten Son to live the, the sinless, perfect life, yet willingly to go to the cross of Calvary to take my sins, the sins of all the world, upon his shoulders, have his body, his flesh, cut and pierced and his blood shed to wash us white as snow and have our sins forgiven. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy is the Son of God to receive our praise, our honor, and our remembrance. Bless us as we partake today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. What's in a name? I am. I am the door, the gate. I'd invite you to turn to John, the 10th chapter, the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, and read with me the first 10 verses of this chapter as we set the stage for our uh, sermon, our message today. In John 10, beginning with verse 1, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they, were ne they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. So Jesus said again, Verily, truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep, and all who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Well, friends, we're halfway through our sermon series called What's in a Name, in which we're looking at the I Am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Each one of these I am states, statements tells us something about Jesus' understanding and knowledge of himself. But the beginning of each statement with that phrase, I am, that tells us even more. Because it echoes the ancient name of God given to Moses at the, at the burning bush when, when, God, when Moses asked God, who should I say send me? And God said, Yahweh, I am who I am. Tell them, I am sent you. And so today we look at Jesus' statement from John chapter 10 in, verse, uh, in the first part of the chapter. I am the door or gate. Now I think we probably need some back, back, background material on these gatekeepers that Jesus is describing. Jesus' statement, I am the gate, sometimes translated, I am the door, has to be set against the backdrop of the events that we would read in John chapter 9. There, the religious leaders have taken issue and complained uh, to Jesus about his healing of a man born blind. Why? Well, because it happened on a Sabbath. And so Jesus has violated one of their rules of, quote, working on the Sabbath. And the result of that action that Jesus performed, that miracle that Jesus performed, 
that man was thrown out of the synagogue. Now, friends, to fully appreciate just how offensive Jesus' claims were, we need to get a better understanding of his context. The world of first century Israel, the world in which he lived and walked here on this earth. Yes, yes, Jesus' life and his message hold significance for all people at all times, in all places, but we better understand that significance if we first see what he was saying within his own cultural and historical framework. The language, the life the culture of the day in which he walked and spoke and taught here on this earth. So Jesus challenged to the dominant religion of his historical context, it actually becomes for us a kind of a case study. And from that we can draw principles for our own context, our own lives. Now remember, In the first century, Israel actually suffered from what some scholars have called classification-itis. The religious leaders of first century Israel considered certain characteristics of their faith to be central to their spiritual lives. And these became identity markers or bookmarks of unique status and calling. I want you to remember that phrase, unique status and calling. So these religious leaders had divided their teaching and their lives and their uh, 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 classification-itis into five different categories. And we we could begin each of these categories with the letter T. The first, Torah, or the law of Moses. You know, the law of Moses was to be obeyed to the letter, especially the Sabbath regulations and the dietary restrictions and the sacrifices. The second T, tradition. Keeping the tradition of the elders, or we could call this the oral Torah, because it expanded more and more on the original written Ten Commandments. But keeping the the oral Torah handed down from their ancestors was held on almost equal status as the Scripture, the written Torah. For example, the law simply says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. But tradition, the oral law tells you how to do that in minute detail, in many, many stipulations, in many, many details. The third T, tribalism. Ethnic, national, and cultural purity were bound together with their religious identity. They didn't recognize other nations as being as pure, as godly, as the people of God, Israel. The next T, territory. A theology of holy geography meant certain land and cities and places were far more sacred than others. And that war was a religious duty whenever this holy land was threatened. So territory was part of their tradition. And then temple. God's presence was believed to to dwell in one holy location in a unique way where worshipers could offer the required sacrifices and receive forgiveness. And I should be reminded that there was one part of that temple that only one person could enter one time each year. The Holy of Holies where the presence of God was believed to be. But I want you to notice two things. First, each of these identity markers, these bookmarks, speak of how exclusive these religious leaders 
and the nation of Israel were. It speaks of exclusivity. Together, they helped to prop up a strong us and them mentality between Israel and the rest of the world. And secondly, Jesus, the Son of God, challenged all of these identity markers in some way. He exposed the ways that they had replaced their calling as, as leaders, as religious leaders. He exposed how they had replaced that calling to bring light to the world with high religious walls that kept sinners away. Now, you have to remember that the purpose of any religious system is to control the forgiveness market, it seems. Or at least in the context of these religious leaders. Because the religious leaders wanted to maintain their position as gatekeepers of access to God. In their minds, their religious system allowed them to dictate who is in and who is out. Who is acceptable and who is not. Who is one of us and who is one of them. Who is worthy and who is not. But praise God, Jesus rejected that whole religious system and replaced it with himself. And he said, I am the gate. I am the door. So where these religious leaders placed themselves as the gatekeepers to who could be one of God's people, Jesus said, I am the door. I am the gate. Now, friends, there are three functions that we can see in this passage and understand. Three functions of a door and make them and understand them to fit Jesus' character as person, as the Son of God. The first function of a door is protection or safety. You know, in the first century world of Jesus and his, and his listeners, common sheep pens were not elaborate structures with fences and, and gates and rails to keep the animals in. Usually they were just simple enclosures with an opening on one side. and They didn't even have an actual door or gate. Once all the sheep were safely in the, in the fold or in this enclosure, it was the common thing for the shepherd to build a fire at that entrance and to sleep there through the night. The shepherd literally became the door to the sheepfold, keeping out any would-be predators outside. Jesus said, now thieves and robbers will try to climb in some other way, but they won't get in through the door. So inside Inside there is safety and rest because the door, the gate, offers protection. A second function of the door is entrance or opportunity. The sheep not only go in to find safety and to sleep at night, but they also go out in the morning to find pasture. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life. And have it to the full. So each morning the shepherd would put out that fire when he arose in the morning. And he would lead the sheep out through that gate or that opening so that they could find life-sustaining pasture and water for that day. So the gate was an opportunity to come in to find safety and rest but it was also a way to go out to find nourishment and blessing. You know, we still find, use that image of a door opening to speak to, of exciting new opportunities as another door has opened. So Jesus is both the door of security, protection, and the door of abundant life. And the third function of a door might be more symbolic for us, but it's the sign of home. 
the sign of believing or belonging. Now, the Beatles might have said it well in one of their, uh, mo- one of their best songs, uh, The Long and Winding Road, where the lyrics say, The long and winding road that leads to your door will never disappear. I've seen that road before. It always leads me here, leads me to your door. Now, friends, the entire Bible, the entire Word of God, is one long story of going away and coming back again, leaving and coming home. Our lives are like that, you know. We leave the garden of childhood innocence to to follow the road of life wherever it takes us. But in the end, we find ourselves longing for home again. We're, as Bob Dylan put it in, in his song, we're knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. So Jesus' statement, I am the door, it resonates on a deep level with the, the, the base story of what it means to be human, to be home. You know, I look forward to a home called heaven. What's heaven like? Ken Geyer, in his devotional Moments with the Savior, shares one image that touches the deepest longings of our hearts. Home. Whatever else heaven might be like, it'll feel like coming home at last because life's journey is a journey home. Home. Friends, what thoughts or feelings does the word home stir in you today? Is it the crackle of a fireplace in winter? Is it the scent of of lilacs and roses in the spring? Is it the creak of the porch swing on the lazy days of summer? Or maybe the falling leaves in autumn? What? What what do you think of? Is it the laughter of friends? The gifts of love that are given and received? Home is a place to belong. A place where I'm missed when I'm not there. But you might say, but not all homes are like that. And how true that is. But even in bad situations, the longing for home is still steadfast. The longing for home still survives. Maybe in that scenario, it's, it's longing for a home that we never had, or the one that we only partially had, or the one we had once, but left, or lost, or once had, but it was taken away from us. But friends, these longing for home or what pulls us toward a home called heaven, like a sort of primal memory. They lead us to a lot of places, geographical places, work places, relational places, comfortable places, many of them. But we always find ourselves longing for something more because heaven is our true home, the place that we belong the place we were meant to live. It's a coming together of my soul, my space, where God is welcome with heaven. God's space, where I am welcome. It can't happen fully in this life because of the limitations of our physical bodies, but the process has begun and will one day be completed with what Paul calls the redemption of our bodies. But friends, in the meantime, there are aspects of the heavenly kind of life that we, be, that we can begin enjoying right now. Like unbroken fellowship with God, where Jesus says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Like newness of life in Christ, where if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. We might have power to do amazing things in this world that God wants done. 
When Jesus says, ask anything in my name and it will be done for you. Or it might be even a taste of what is to come. We are now seated in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And it certainly gives us the promise. We left a garden paradise as humans, but we're headed for a garden city, New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem with the river of the water of life flowing right down the middle of it with the tree of life on each side of it. And as John records in Revelation 21, 25, the gates of the city will never be shut. Now friends, Jesus fits this image of a door or a gate on so many levels. It's one of my favorite descriptions of Jesus and what he's done for us. He is our safety, our protection from all harm and danger. He is our opening into the abundant life that God wants for us. And he's the fulfillment of our deepest longing, the longing for home, heaven. Jesus, the door, calls out to you and to me today to enter through the gate, Jesus, today, and experience the abundant life of Jesus Christ. Don't be like those religious leaders and play the us and them game. Enter the sheepfold through Jesus, the door who gave himself for us. Our song of decision and dedication today is one that says, Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He loves us so much that he gave himself up for us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the word the scriptures that show us the impact of your son Jesus as he moved and walked and taught here on this earth as he confronted the religious leaders who who built walls to exclude anyone different from them thank you for your son Jesus for being our door, our gate to your fold, and for the invitation that you have given through him that all who come to him and through him have life abundant and life to the full. Oh God, open for us this door to life, not just everlasting life after death, but real life even here on this earth. Our hearts are longing for true home. Be for us the door that opens to that place of our heart's deepest desire. Heaven and you in our spirit in our hearts, even here. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. He is jealous Love's like a hurricane, I am a tree Bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affection are for me Oh how he loves us so Oh how he loves us How he loves us so.
Inside of my chest I don't 